Hello and welcome to today's podcast. Um, following on the series, today we have innovation evangelist Jessica Constantinides and Tom Treeswright, the applied futurologist. Over to you guys. Well, let's get this moving then. Yeah. And let's start from, I think, one of the really interesting things that came out of the research for me, particularly with regard to a lot of the conversations I've been having with clients recently, is this this sort of recognition by half of the people you surveyed or almost you know, almost half the executives and slightly more than half of the employees that while we've done a lot of hard work we've we've adapted very rapidly to this crisis actually there's still a long way to go but that means that half the people surveyed think we've done the hard part now and we can just coast from here and I don't know about you, but that both, I, I was thrilled that that many people recognise there's a lot of challenge still to go and slightly terrified by how many people don't recognise that. I agree with you, Tom. I would be terrified as well if I would read that. <laughs> but in all fairness, I think, you know, half of the people who are terrified and probably not really there yet and think that they haven't sorted it out, they're probably right. Because I, I do think that when people say we've sorted it, they probably refer to things that they wanted to do and they actually achieved that. But do we really sort something that we don't even know the future of, right? So I think, you know, looking at the 50-50, I think it's quite accurate. If you're a hardcore company with big IT and you do these things a lot, then yeah, you have a solid base. You have done some transformation. And you, yes, you, you are somewhat digital, but it's not the end goal, right? You're not fully there. We're not fully embracing AI. We're not fully embracing all the technologies. And you, you know, every single day I turn around and there's a new tech out there. So I think it will always be an evolution of catching up instead of you know, being ahead of the curve. But on the other hand, I don't want to make it a full doomsday, but there are people that you know, are struggling. They are struggling because they weren't ready. They didn't have the baselines in. They didn't have everything. And what I see them doing is, and, and I, I think it's quite accurate when I say this, are you implementing this because you have to, or are you implementing this because it's a strategy? And I think mm. most of them are implementing because they have to now, but that's a quick fix. I call that a quick and dirty fix. That's not necessarily what your business strategy should look like. It's a tool that you use to get to what you need to do. Yeah, but It's not something that you embed in the DNA of your business. And I think that's where a lot of people probably haven't actually gotten to their potential, their full potential in case of using AI, using chatbots, using computers to do all of that heavy thinking, and then just let that human interaction make that final decision. And I think that's where I think, you know, a lot of the people transitioning post COVID, they, they go like, yeah, we're there, but that's in their minds in terms of this is what we wanted to achieve on the short term. This is what we wanted to have now. This is how we're going to survive. But is that something that they should be doing for the next three, five, seven years? I don't think it's embedded in that strategy yet, unless you're obviously a bigger company that's thinking way ahead. Yeah. So I think that's probably where the 50-50 comes in. It, it feels to me like lots of companies have done a really good job. We, we have to praise people here, I think, mm -hmm. for the speed at which they've adapted. But what they've done is they've taken everything they were doing before in the old world and just trying to sort of ported it roughly online. <laughs> so, okay, we can now do this remotely. We've semi-automated some of this stuff. We've dropped some new software on people. But actually, we've done none of the cultural development, the etiquette around it, the application around it. And like you say, it's not, in, it's not strategic in so many cases yet. It's not okay. actually, this is a great break point to do things completely differently. It's, yeah. okay, how do we keep doing what we do, but in this weird environment? And it, I guess that, that you know, to, to come back to your point, you know, don't want to be totally doomsday. It feels like we're at the point now where actually people are starting, even those people who did everything in a rush and a bit of emergency, are now at that point of making these conscious decisions saying, right, okay, I can sort of start to see what the future looks like. Let's build towards that now. Let's start to, yeah, let's start to mm -hmm. backfill some strategy into, into our emergency adaptations. I agree with you. And I think, you know, it's, it's finding that right strategy, which is probably what people are struggling with. Because uh, what do you do, right? If you don't necessarily know where to start, it's, it's a difficulty. And I think, you know, 94% of the executives, they do admit that there's a lot of offline stuff still there. They, they admit, you know, that even though we've ticked the box and we're halfway there, there's still a lot to do. And I think to some extent, it's difficult, depending also in which vertical you are, right? It, it, we compare like a Coca-Cola to, to uh, you know, manufacturing of something else. It's, it's even different, even though both of them are manufacturing something. Mm. So I, I think, you know, 
where should we go? It's, it's very difficult to understand where that sits, but also within the regulations. I, I believe that, you know, rules and regulations post COVID have become so difficult to understand in terms of, you know, are we capable of doing these things? Can we, can we not, should we? Um, what is the consequence if we don't? What is the consequence if we do? And I think they're also a little bit struggling with that. So I think, you know, executives don't have an easy job these days because whatever you do, it has to be, you know, with the mindset of being strategic more, more forward. But where do you start, right? Well, That's I mean, a difficult given, piece. You know, given this more sort of distributed environment we're all shifted around, you know, one of the things I think we're starting to see is a bit of a sort of breakdown in hierarchy and a redistribution of power as well, because you have to start trusting people yeah. to get, you know, to get on with things and deliver results. And I guess it leads me to a question really about who's responsible for those next steps. Like who's going to be taking on the responsibility of progressing from this sort of emergency adaptation to a more strategic adaptation? Do you still see that role sitting at the sort of the leadership and executive level? Or do you see it much more spread out? I think, you know, changing a DNA has to be lived in the exact environment, right? You, you either full with it with everybody or it's being lived on the sidelines and then we call it skunk works, right? <laughs> um, but, but if you live and breed a change from senior management onwards, you also have to be, to your point, Tom, you have to let go and you have to give people an element of shining. It, the cat's doing crazy things. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so as soon as you get to a point where you trust people, and, and I think this is where, I, even within, within service now, I, I never had the, the urge to you know, get up to my boss and tell him what I did because I knew that he, he had my back. But on the other hand, if you don't do that, and if you still do the classic, oh, you need to be nine to five behind your desk, or you need to do this, or uh, you need to report to somebody specific, you're actually impeding with that progress, with that transition to having that. So I think it's, it's, it's both, you know, from senior management, you've got to empower and you've got to give people the notion that it's okay to say things. It's okay to embrace innovation. It's okay to do something new. It's okay to be out of your comfort zone. And we get that, right? But it's also from the people to actually step up and learn. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of went, and, and this is where I see from, from the bottom up, we kind of see like, yeah, that's not necessarily been my job before. And because of this COVID, we all had to change, right? And the natural behavior is, yo, if I don't have to, then I'm not going to do it, right? So, so I think this is where the shift in, in terms of people are now going like, yeah, I'm going to have to do this. And then they step up because they find themselves comfortable in doing something that they've never done. And they kind of go like, yeah, I can do this. I can work from home. I can juggle work life. I can do this with the kids. And then all of a sudden they have these smashing ideas and they bring them up to senior management and senior management goes like, why have you never told us this before? Yeah. <laughs> and this is where I now see on board meetings, on EBCs, I see these people who normally are very quiet because there was a strict hierarchy. And I kind of go like, you know what? Sorry, I'm just going to say it. And they do that. And all of a sudden, the board turns around and they go like, that's a pretty good idea. You know what? We go big or we go home. And then all of a sudden, it's been embraced. And then all of a sudden, you get a speaking voice as a non-exec. And you see people rise up to the occasion. And I think that's quite new in that whole COVID and post-COVID environment. Previous to that, you had you know senior management. And you, unless if that was a culture inside your company, you wouldn't really speak up, right? You're absolutely right. It's, it's interesting. You know, one of the first things I do when I go into new consulting clients is I look for these things I call pressure points. I have this set of questions I ask them mm. about what frustrates you at work? What stops you being as productive as you could be? And it all just comes tumbling out of them. And it yeah. feels like this crisis has been a provocation for those things to come out. And so people say, do you know what? OK, I'm, I'm on my own. I'm in my own environment. This is my domain now. I'm going to fix those problems. And it's really interesting starting to see people cast around for the tools they can use to address those problems. Okay, what can I use to go and automate something? How can I shift this process from this sort of old world system, something that works for us now? And, and I'm seeing this sort of, sort of democratization of, of control and approach and people starting to look for those tools they can use to overcome those pressure points in their own work. You're still there. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I was wait, I'm, waiting were, the, I'm waiting for the cat to bite through the. Uh, no, 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 no. It's just that the, the internet's <laughs> very flaky. Sorry for that. Um, could could you repeat that last question? Because yeah, it's just, just. I was just saying that you know it's um, you know, when people are operating in their in their home domains and they've got their you know they're in control of their own environment and they're being given a bit more trust, a bit more autonomy and responsibility um, in order to to take on their own work. You know, suddenly these things that maybe would only come out with the provocation of a question before are mm -hmm. starting to tumble out of them. They're not just saying this is a problem. They're saying, OK, I can build a solution to this. They're casting around saying, what software, what tools can I use to overcome that problem? And you're really seeing that, that sort of very sort of employee driven innovation. I think it's, yeah. it's really exciting to see. No, I agree with you. And I think, you know, what I've seen in, in the last few months is that people kind of turn to, you know, consumerized apps to make their life easier. And then they turn around to the business and they go like, why can't we have something Siri like? Or why can't we have something Alexa like? Or why can't we have this? And that's a very good question. Because, you know, if it works very well to do your shutters, your lights, your Google Home and play your Spotify playlist, why shouldn't you be able to do the same things at, at work to, I don't know, get access to something? You know, I, I was discussing with one of the guys as well. I said, you know, we have all this AI, we have all this machinery, we have all this intelligence, and still we need to look for a file by typing the file name. <laughs> Where did that come in? Why can't we just say, hey, computer, give me the file of last Tuesday, 5 p.m.? You, yeah. you don't even need to know what it's called, right? Because we can tag and we can search and we can do all of that. But we're not doing that because nobody's ever thought, oh, that might be a handy feature, Right. Even though all of the equipment is in, in, in our you know, fingertips, we can do that. And there's the, this, this IoT kind of if this, then that kind of applications that make that possible. And people kind of reflect and go like, if I could do this with that, that could be brilliant. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden you have these skunk words coming up. And then I see people using transcribers. I'm like, why are we still taking meeting notes? There's, there's apps out there like Otter and all of the other ones that just transcribe whatever you're saying. I know the translation is not brilliant, but, but if, you, if I have to modify a text with only, I don't know, maybe 20 sentences to modify because the translator got something horribly wrong, then it's still quicker than writing down a full-blown report of a meeting, right? Absolutely. And I'm just thinking, if we embed that into our environment, then the question is, should, should we even transcribe? Because maybe we should just put audio files in there. Should we still do presentations? It's a, it's a question. Yeah. And I think, you know, if, if you look at how companies are now coping with the, with the whole environment of, you know, virtual engagements and virtual events, they still have a long way to go, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the interesting things is, like, where to start. Because this has triggered mm. a lot of you know thinking in people, a lot of strategizing, a lot of re revisiting of of the you know the of the way things were in business as usual. And people, you know, I think the, the research certainly shows that people want to tackle that, mm. and it, it also threw up some perhaps some pointers as to where the starting points are. Because you know, I think you know, IT seems to have come out of this pretty well, albeit there's some concern about how fast it could adapt if something else happened. But, you know, there are some other departments, you know, other functions in the organization where it feels like a really good starting point where people mm. inside that function could go and start to innovate and leverage these tools. And I know that, you know, customer service, HR, finance, sales and marketing, all of those seem like opportunities. You know, where would you start? Have you come across particular examples where you just want to dive in and start to fix things? <laughs> Most of the times, and this is my consultancy cap coming on, right? Because I've been a consultant for more than 20 years. So I, I try to look at where they are and, and how to fix something quickly in terms of, you know, don't, don't build something on a broken foundation, that kind of philosophy. Mm. But then I kind of look at what is, what is the quick fix that gives the best value. And I think these days, communication is key. So regardless where, which department it comes from or where it goes into, keeping everybody on the same page is the most important piece because as soon as you lose trust, confidence, or communication, something goes horribly wrong because then people start to assume and you know the assumption is not the best way to get people into that mindset right so i i believe that a lot of companies would really benefit from communicating correctly and i think you know 63% of employees they 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 think they could actually adapt with new environments 
um, like a chatbot or, or something else from customer service or HR or finance or whatever. It doesn't necessarily matter. But they just need to get that chance to get that information at their fingertips. And, and if I reflect to what I'm doing on a daily basis, the funny thing is I had a mobile app for a year and a half. And I only used it when I thought, you know, oh, yeah, maybe that's on the mobile app. These days, I'm constantly using it. It's an extra screen. And, and I, I kind of reflected in, inwards, kind of going like, this is funny because I'm actually not that mobile, but I'm using the mobile app. So, so it's a bit of a contradiction, but I think it comes down to the point where I, I look at the phone and I kind of go, yeah, it's on there as well. So why am I not using it? Because it gives you that say, different experience or an appropriate experience to that need. It's a chatbot. And I think the, the easiest way to get something is to ask and what we normally do, you know, that we, we call it um, the, the, you know, the, the tribal hierarchy that you normally do, right? You go to the tribe elders to ask the question. If they don't know, <laughs> then you go to another tribe and ask their elders. But, but we don't have that anymore. You can't just walk up to the next cubicle and ask your elder. You can't just walk up to the reception and say, you know, uh, Lisa from HR, you think she knows this? I don't know if Lisa knows this. But you know what? Siri knows. And, and, and I think if you then get to a point where that natural reflection of what should I do, because that also, that DNA needs to change on how we solve problems. Because our natural way of solving problems is asking somebody. If that natural flow now goes to finding a chatbot or finding an app or finding something else and ask the app and then trust the app because the trust factor is also very important. Mm. Trust the app to give you the right information then you're off. I, I also, when I'm, I'm with customers, I compare it to Tesla, right? Tesla is a beautiful car. It's actually a data center on wheels. Mm -hmm. Do I trust it? Absolutely not. Yeah. I wouldn't give my life in a Tesla and let it drive on its own because I don't trust it yet. If, if I get to a point where I get to drive the Tesla multiple times and I don't have to correct it for about two, three, four weeks, then I'll start to trust it. And it's the same thing with using IT tools. We need to have that experience in order to get that trust, in order to trust that it will do whatever we want it to do. And if it doesn't, that we can still take the steering wheel and correct, right? That's what we want. And I think that's the same thing. And we've all been forced inside a Tesla for the last three months. <laughs> and I think it's, it's a comparison that I think is quite accurate because we couldn't go out. There was no alternative. It, either on the Zoom call, or losing your job. So, so that is where, you know, the force of the evolution pushed us. Now, on the side, a lot of people actually kind of went like, there's a lot more that we can do with this. And that's where the innovation kicks in. Because they're comfortable now with using computers. They're comfortable now with using tablets. They're comfortable now running around and showing off cats and kids and husbands on phones. And I think that level of confidence is something that you never saw before, you know, and it all started with, I think it was a CNN or a BBC news um, video where the guy was doing a full blown interview and the two yeah. kids walked in and then his wife pulled the kids out. That's where it started. If that is possible on national TV, you can have a little bit of an accident at home as well. It doesn't matter. Right. And it's that, that bring your work into your life kind of environment that gives you that executive feel of, I can do this. And once you get that, then finding the right tools, finding the right communication, finding the right platforms, finding the right connected environments, because that's the biggest deal. You need to connect everything, HR, customer finance, sales, marketing. It should not be a silo. Because if it's a silo, then you need a perpetual tool, then you need a perpetual connection, then you're not going to have that benefit of connecting everything in there. So it's finding those but actually the gaps in connections that you should do first mm -hmm. and then looking at what drives our business because the biggest project will actually be the most successful if it brings you the biggest value. So find that value chain and fix that first and everything else will follow. And I think you have to capture that culture now. We have to capture and sort of yeah. bottle this spirit and make it part of the organization going forward. Like you know, Make sure that people 
don't just think they have the permission to do these things in a crisis, but actually we give people permission to do these things in the long term, to keep that innovation going, to keep opening their mouths and pointing to those things that don't work and finding mm -hmm. solutions to them. Absolutely. And I think, you know, in all fairness, a lot of people, when I see them on Zoom calls, they have these virtual backgrounds. And I'm like, I, I get it if somebody else is in, in the house and you can't really get the private moment. I get that. But on the other hand, I think, you know, are you, are you trying to, you know, be corporate as you can with a virtual background? Or like me, I have a physical one and I have the cat running around and I have all sorts of things going on. But that's okay. You know, I have never had a ex senior executive on a call tell me that I couldn't actually have my cat run over the desk. Because what happens in those calls when the cat does run over the desk, they go like, oh, kitty cat, I have mine here. And all of a sudden the call is full of cats. <laughs> and, and I'm like, that didn't happen six months ago. That was never there. That kind of ease and, and trust was never there. So if we now look at the fact that it's possible and people are comfortable and we use the right tools and we're not afraid to let people inside our private life because that's essentially what we do, yeah, then you can really build that trust up because I found out during those virtual executive briefings, there was a whole lot more trust than when we had the physical ones in the offices because there was still an official kind of like barrier between people. And now I found out that these barriers are being pulled down. So if that is happening with us and our customers, I'm sure that within the customers, it's happening as well. I'm sure within their partners, it's happening as well. So, and then, you know, finding the right tools, the trust is there. It's just about implementing them and finding the right use case for them. Brilliant. Every day is bring your pet to work day. Well, we actually did already have pets at uh, the ServiceNow office in the beginning, but then we had to stop that because of allergies. But uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of Silicon Valley companies actually do allow pets. So we don't have this on this side of the pond, unfortunately. We don't have pets <laughs> in the office. But in the US, it's quite common. So, so why not? Why not? Thank you very much for that compelling conversation. Um, looking forward to what's up next. Thank you.